So yesterday, January 6th, was Epiphany. Some churches and denominations recognize the Sunday closest to January 6th as Epiphany Sunday. And Epiphany is the story of Magi, wise leaders who search for Jesus in order to honor him. And there are some different directions we could go in for Epiphany. On Epiphany, we could focus in on the theme of light as the Magi are guided to Jesus by a bright star. On Epiphany, we could focus on gifts, as the Magi offer precious gifts to Jesus. So too do we offer precious gifts to Jesus in acknowledgement of his role as ruler of our lives. As the Magi are leaders from diverse countries, these diverse leaders show that Jesus is going to be not just for one special group, but Jesus is going to be for the world. On Epiphany, we could focus on wisdom, as to have an epiphany about something is to come to a new understanding. And that's what we're going to focus on today, that last piece, wisdom. But more specifically, we'll focus on God's wisdom that comes through the church. In the passage from Ephesians today, we have an extraordinarily long sentence from Paul. This is what he writes. Although I am the very least of all the saints, the grace was given to me to bring to the Gentiles the news of the boundless riches of Christ, and to make everyone see what is the plan of the mystery hidden for the ages in God who created all things, so that through the church, that's our key, through the church, the wisdom of God in its rich variety might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Blah, 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 blah. There's a lot to love about Ephesians, but sometimes it is a little thick. Now we're going to take a closer look. We're going to unpack this sentence because Ephesians is saying something really, really important to MCCLV today. But first we want to focus again on that, that phrase, through the church. The wisdom of God is made known through the church. And so if you give me a C, anyone? Give me a C. Give me an H. Give me a U. U. Give me an R. R. Give me another C. C. Give me another H. What does that spell? Church. 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 You know, the church, thank you, church. Uh, the church certainly needs a cheer these days. I'm going to share just a few of the startling statistics. Some may know these facts and figures. Uh, they may be new to others. In 2005, the average uh, worship attendance at a Christian church uh, in the United States was 129 people. That's in 2005. In 2015, the average worship attendance at a church in the U.S. was 80 people. From 129 a Sunday to 80 people on average. Uh, that's a huge or huge uh, decline. Uh, in, a of just, in a matter of just 10 years, the culture has changed drastically. Metropolitan community churches, the denomination has followed these trends from 2008 to 2015. The denomination of metropolitan community churches experienced the loss of 240,000 worshipers around the world. Can we all say ouch? Ouch. In 2008, 680,000 people walked into worship at an MCC church in 2015. 440,000 people worshipped at an MCC church. That's the loss of almost a quarter million people. So people are not just walking away from the, uh, the Christian church in the United States right now, they're running away at full speed. And so church must be done in new ways, not to change Christ, but so that Christ may change people through the church. <coughs> you may have seen an article in the Morning Call newspaper uh, yesterday. It went into detail about uh, Hackman's Bible Bookstore. For the past 19 years, the local Hackman's Bible Bookstore has had declining returns, and the store will be closing this spring, and that's after 70 years of business. And the closing is likely due to a number of factors. One of them being that all shoppers, including those who shop for Christian items, all shoppers are increasingly turning toward what? Online shopping. Uh, but store owner Marsha Hackman she says this, forget Amazon. People don't go to church anymore. And that's a huge thing. So we may not often think of it, but church attendance impacts other things, like retail businesses. Now, if mainline Protestant continues 
uh, if mainline Protestantism continues its decline, it has 23 Easter's left on this earth. Now, mainline Protestantism includes denominations like the Methodists, the Presbyterians, the Lutherans, while those who identify as unaffiliated with any uh, religion, they've increased in the U.S., right? You've probably heard about this. 60% of people in the U.S. in uh, 2007 identified as unaffiliated. That's increased to 23% in 2014. 23% of Americans said they didn't affiliate with any religion. And this group of people is often called the nuns, N-O-N-E-S, not the N-U-N-S, but the, the nuns. And then there are the duns, people who say they are done with Christianity, that number is increasing. Also the nuns identified as, as uh, unaffiliated, they may still be open to church, but the duns, they're over it. And they've said farewell to the Christian church. Now some of the nuns and some of the duns grew tired of so many churches being anti-LGBT. But strangely, some anti-LGBT churches are among the churches that are actually not declining. In a study done this past year on the largest 100 churches in the United States, not a single one of these mega churches had a policy affirming LGBT people or same-sex relationships. The largest churches in America, the churches that have thousands and thousands and thousands of members are overwhelmingly churches that are anti-LGBT or silent on the issue. And interestingly, that same study found that only seven of the largest 100 churches are led by a person of color, and only one of the 100 largest churches, only one of the 100 largest churches lists a female pastor on its staff. Now, if, if people think mega churches are the main representation of Christianity, then no wonder people are leaving Christianity so quickly. And more progressive churches certainly need a louder voice. Now, over Christmas time, I had a chance to talk about the church and Christianity in general with a person in their 20s, a millennial, right? That coveted demographic. And the young woman, she asked me, actually, why I thought church attendance had declined so much in the United States. And I shared that I thought it was a number of different things. One thing I think is that there's a lot that's competing with the church right now. Technology has extended the work week. And with limited time off, people may not choose the church as often. I also mentioned that in the church there are glitches. Now, on a random YouTube TV clip, a preacher may share an impeccable sermon. Or in any given music video, a singer may give a flawless performance. But in the church, live and in person, the preaching will not be perfect. Wrong notes will be sung. Other parts of the worship service may not go smoothly. If worship is the work of all the people present, then worship will naturally be flawed and imperfect. But those in the church know that it does not matter if a worship service is flawed and imperfect as long as that worship service is oriented to God. Worship is never a performance for an audience, but it is the work of an entire congregation, in person and online. Hello, online folks who are, are watching right now. Uh, worship, again, never performance, it is the work of an entire congregation for God. Now, the young person I was talking with over Christmas time, she exited the church due to a difference in beliefs. It wasn't technology, it wasn't the distractions of the 21st century that kept her away from the church. It was the belief system of Christianity, the idea that one had to believe in things like the Trinity or the virgin birth or the bodily resurrection, and I'm going to get back to belief in a moment. I can already feel the anxiety rising a bit in the sanctuary. But I do want to say this, that despite all of this bad news, all this hard news, the church is not going to disappear. The church is not dying, but the church is transforming. It could be the 500-year itch. Right? Some observers have mentioned that every 500 years, the church is bound to transform. And it's been 500 years since the Protestant Reformation began. And so the time is right for another period of, of rethinking the role of the church. And I will be so bold, I will be so bold as to say that I think Metropolitan Community Church of the Lehigh Valley 
has a great opportunity to be a model to other churches about handling change. For instance, we seem to move about every five years. Right? Our rental lease here at the Church of the Major it is over in two and a half years. We may be moving again. We really don't know what is ahead. But we do know that the church is not a building. The church of God is not a static monument. It is a living, breathing thing. Church is not a facility. Church is an event. The great theologian Karl Barth, he puts it this way. The church is not the being of a state or institution, but the being of an event which the assembled and the self-assembling community is actively at work. For Karl Barth, church is not a thing, it is an event. And notice that Barth does not limit uh, the event language to worship. All of church is an event. The worship, the outreach, the coffee hour, the mission trips, the Bible studies, the board meetings, the children's Sunday school, all of church is an event, a living, breathing thing. Church is an event. And through the event of the church, the wisdom of God in its rich variety might not be made known. Now, the church is not a thing or a state or an institution, thank God. That means that there's room for a variety of beliefs. And here at Metropolitan Community Church of the Lehigh Valley, we come together weekly despite our different beliefs. Some here may be Trinitarian. Others may be Unitarian. Some here may believe in the virgin birth. Others may believe that Jesus was conceived differently. Some here may believe in the resurrection of the body. Others may believe in an opportunity for new life. Some here may be Universalists, believing that salvation is for all. Others may believe that salvation is only through belief in Jesus Christ. Some here may believe that, that Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. Others may believe that Christ is one way among other ways, one truth amidst other truths, and one way of life among other ways of life. Let's pause for a moment. Despite our different beliefs, look, the roof has not caved in. The roof has not fallen in on us. I'm not seeing any lightning strikes. I'm not feeling an earthquake. The ground has not opened up to swallow us because of our different beliefs. There is no one way to be a Christian. There is no one way to be a follower of Jesus Christ. We follow Jesus in different ways. The specific belief does not matter as much as taking the time to think on what we believe as we study the Bible, as we look at tradition, as we gather in worship and prayer and song. Okay, we'll cheer there, yes. Now I would not start with Ephesians in a study of the Bible. I think the Gospels tend to be the best place to start, but Ephesians is such an important labor work, and it provides followers of Jesus with some really vital teachings. The church in Ephesus, like most of the earliest churches, is made up of a diverse group of you see, people entering into the Ephesian church come from a Jewish background as well as a Gentile or pagan background. And this may seem like a small, mundane fact, but it's actually revolutionary. As a church, as the Christian church is getting established, it will not be limited to just one culture. There will be a diversity of people. And the only thing people will have in common is Christ. So people will enter into the church not based on their family or heritage, but based on choice, a choice for Christ. Now our passage from Ephesians starts with these words. This is the reason that I, Paul, am a prisoner for Christ Jesus for the sake of you Gentiles. Paul, remember, not always been Paul. Previously he had been a guy named Saul who persecuted Christians. But then Saul had a confrontation with Christ on the road to Damascus and he became Paul champion for Christ. Now in his letter to the church in Ephesus, Paul explains that the grace of God is working through him, and that the mystery was made known to Paul by revelation. Revelation, the Greek word is apocalypsis, and apocalypsis means disclosure. The mystery has been disclosed to Paul, and that mystery is the inclusion of the Gentiles. The church will not be limited to just one group of people, it will be for all people. Now, a revelation cannot be understood through hard work. We don't have an epiphany due to rely on our intuition. God's wisdom does not come to us using our reasoning skills. 
hard work, intuition, and reason. These are all good skills we deploy from time to time, but they are not used in discerning God's revelations. Instead, we understand a revelation only if and only when God's to us. Revelations are from God and according to God's timing. Now, Paul points out that he's not special, and he calls himself the very least of all the saints. God did not reveal to Paul the plan to include the Gentiles because Paul was special or because he was better than anyone. God revealed it to Paul because God is God. And God called Paul to this particular calling. The grace was given to Paul to bring the Gentiles the news of the boundless riches of Christ. For the power of God's grace working through him, Paul is going to help everyone see what is the plan of the mystery hidden for the ages and God who created all things. Paul has a message of God's inclusive love, and nothing will stop him from sharing that message. Now notice that this wisdom from God is not shared through the workplace. According to Ephesians, this wisdom of God is not shared through a corporation or a nonprofit organization or the military or law enforcement or an educational system or the media or technology or the internet or the healthcare system or through the government. Nothing necessarily bad or wrong about these places. They are simply not where the wisdom of God is going to be revealed. Where is the wisdom of God in its rich variety going to work through? The church. Yes, through the church. M-E-C-H-U-R-C-H, church. Yes. There is no other place built by God on Christ through which this wisdom will be revealed. It is through the church. I guess we still need the church. I guess we still need churches that God may work through to make known the wisdom of God in its rich variety. Variety, the Greek word polykoikulos, meaning diverse, multifaceted. I guess we especially need churches that are diverse enough in their beliefs to shine forth this diverse wisdom of God. I guess the world still needs Metropolitan Community Church of the Lehigh Valley. <laughs> what an honor for the church. Now knowing this about the church, I would run for the church. I know, I know I'm a pastor. And I'm supposed to love the church. But I need you to know that if tomorrow I woke up and I was no longer a pastor, if tomorrow I woke up and I no longer did this gig, I would still run toward the church because the church is where God's wisdom is revealed and I want to be the place where the wisdom of God in its rich variety is made known. No matter where I'm living, no matter what I'm doing, I'm going to run toward the church to soak in this wisdom of God. And if I am ever under care somewhere, if I'm ever living in a place where I cannot get to the church, oh, I pray the church can come to me. I pray the church can come to my long-term care facility. So not only is the wisdom of God made known to all, Ephesians tells us that God's Wisdom is also made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Who are these rulers and authorities? Well, biblical scholar William Loder names these rulers and authorities as demonic forces lurking behind the eagles of the day, or themselves embodied in the instrumentalities of governmental and private power. They're sometimes referred to as powers and principalities. And these rulers and authorities are everywhere in heaven and on earth, and they need to know, they need to experience God's wisdom through the church. This is a high, high calling for the church. The church is the place that speaks truth to power. The church is the place that speaks truth to power. Why would we want to be in any other place? We need the church now more than ever as the rulers and authorities of our age, the powers and the principalities, the forces of darkness and death and violence and, and deprivation as they try to get their way. What does the church do? Well the, well, the church stands in the way of these powers and principalities and says, no way, get away. 
And the church doesn't do this by its own power, but only by the power of God, the one true ruler, the one true authority, the one true power, the God who unleashes the forces of love and forgiveness and grace and mercy and generosity. The church, the church and its people are not ruled by the cosmic powers of darkness that want us to create power and wealth and domination and but we are ruled instead by Jesus, who is our Lord, who is our light and salvation. In our diverse beliefs, in our diverse demographics, we defeat the rulers and authorities who have all of those gigabytes of information about us. And you know, every single place we've ever clicked on the internet, they think they rule us, they think they own us, but not if we are in Christ. Amen. Now the church has its challenges and problems. Any place full of humans has its challenges and problems. Yeah, the church has its glories and its beauties and its light and its inspirations and its wisdom. As a random kid sitting in a pew week after week after week in the church of my youth, I am so grateful for all of the adults who showed up week after week after week so that the church could keep on being the church. I'm so grateful for the accompanist who showed up and all the instrumentalists, the guitarists, the musicians who let God work through them to fill the sanctuary. I'm grateful for the vocalists and the song leaders who showed up, the readers, the guy who had the voice of God and the woman who spoke like a teacher. I'm grateful for all the ushers and the Eucharistic ministers and the priests and, and all the people who made a commitment week after week to receive the wisdom of God through the church. Now that a, a number of decades have passed since my youth, I'm one of those people who's being called on to show up week after week after week after week to be a body of Christ for a hurting world. To be a body of Christ for a random kid who just needs to see the commitment of others. To be a body of Christ to stand against the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Give me a C-H-U-R-C-H. Church. Church. Praise God for the gift of the church through which we receive the, the wisdom of God in its rich variety, that it might be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Let us pray. We thank you for epiphanies, God, for moments of understanding. We thank you for the church, through which we receive your wisdom. Continue growing this, your church. 